Man is right, welcome back to the shop. And today, um, a lot of people have asked the question and so forth um, about the Desmo system. Um, when I first did these videos a long while back, uh, I explained what the springs were for, but um, there seems to be an awful lot of comments that either missed that video or whatever. Uh, but it is an interesting subject, full stop. So we're going to explain why why this exists what the fuck is this <laughs> i pointed and you couldn't see like a tit <laughs> dropping every time every time so why is there a spring in this system and what is the ducati um oh what is the desmodromic system all about what was it for um and so on and so on so uh back in the day um, what used to happen is that um, your conventional exhaust um, compression springs, oh, you, not exhaust, <laughs> your compression springs, generally on the exhaust side because it was hotter um, and suffered from higher thermal expansion and so on and so forth. Um, but the regular compression springs that are in that head over there, but I can't be bothered getting that out, um, would fail. Um, they'd either crack stuff like that. After they, they sorted that idea out, the next problem um, with basically RPM limitations was uh, valve flow and uh, bounce flow, all these other tasties. Now, I'll do individual videos about what they are. The reason why I haven't done them videos, I've been talking about them for quite a while now, the reason why I haven't done them videos is because they're not really an issue anymore. But, you know, they are a talking point and it's good to know these things. So, uh, what used to happen is that basically the, the springs themselves have limitations. Well, fucking everything does, you know, but this was their limitation. And it basically limited RPM or it meant it was just a bit wobbly up there when you used to go on higher and higher RPM. And then what they did is they solved those problems, and they solved those problems with multiple things. We'll briefly go over some of them now. Uh, dual springs, so you'll notice in the 80s and 90s a lot, you'll notice there are dual springs, so there's one spring inside another. Um, this is all to do with uh, resonances, basically, of the, the materials and the springs themselves. And because one is bigger than the other, that means it has more mass. It's also a different, usually a different um, wire diameter. Um, but there's also loads of other things. Reducing weight in the valve train, dishing valves, um, basically changing the inertia. Um, when you go to bigger valves, that changes the flex in the um, actual valve seat itself, so the seat in here, and so on. And it's a bigger area to distribute all the impact, the impulsing that's happening when you hit things, because uh, you're going over a bigger area, blah, 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 blah. Things started to change. Um, but the biggest one, really, was just making changes to the valve train system, um, the valves in particular making them lighter and so on and valve springs and fucking around with stuff like that um, and changing the springs some have uh, uh, are actually square so the cross section of the spring instead of being a circular wire it's actually a square and there's all these things some are progressive springs um, some are tapered so you have a tapered spring there was loads of different <coughs> <coughs> Jesus, excuse me. Oh, I'll edit that out. No, oh, what? Fuck it. <laughs> oh, human. So, um, to solve a lot of those problems back in the day, um, the Desmo system was a different way of doing it. Now, someone did mention that um, about torsional springs, there is a thing called uh, basically hairpin springs. And there were a lot of old school engines that had them. It had a valve and one of the, basically a torsional spring, like this, two of them either side. And then basically one end's rooted down, one end's connected to the top, and it basically just pushes like that. I'll show you some pictures. Um, so a lot of things have been tried um, in the past with different types of valve springs and so on and so forth. 
um yeah you know so there's there's loads and loads and loads and loads this was one of the systems and um the beautiful thing about this is you know it is mechanical and when they were having valve spring failures where the, the valve spring itself would use to snap and stuff um this was the ultimate solution because it, it would never break the thing that actuates the valves to open them so basically the cam lobes um, was also responsible for closing them so if it can open it it can close it however there is a problem and what that problem is move all this shit to one side oh the deal you'll know that your um top of your valve so your valve tip so you know just give them the tip and only for a minute the tip on the end here the valve stem and whatever your drive is so we'll just call this our drive uh, driver so this can either be a push rod directly it could be a rocker arm it could be a tap in the end of a rocker arm it could be a bucket it could be a shim it could be directly driven by a cam whatever it is there has to be a clearance in here and I did this video where I heated up a valve and measured how much a valve expands. Um, this is due to thermal expansion. So as you heat this valve up, this valve will grow. Which means that this clearance in here, this will decrease. This is a it minuses, this decreases. Um, so there has to be a clearance here. Obviously, whatever that driver is also expands. And everything expands outwards. That's obviously not. It's not implosion. It's an explosion. It you know expands outwards instead of contracting. So this clearance will always close up. Now the beautiful thing about springs is that they don't need this. Right? Springs don't need this because springs, as long as they're preloaded, which basically means that they're compressed slightly with a compression spring. Um, these preloaded springs are fine because any, you know, any expansion stuff like that is taken care of. Um, a good example is the springs on your exhaust. Some exhausts have springs instead of mounting bolts into the head. They just have springs. Those springs are expansion springs and they're trying to contract and they're pulling, but if anything expands and pushes against it, they'll, they've got some wiggle room. Fantastic. So the problem with this system is, is that if you have a an actuation cam to close the valve, so this thing is pushing the valve closed, if it's hard against a stop, so basically this cam here, this big outer cam, is force is forcing against that rocker there let me get this out of your way so you can see so basically this outer section here is forcing like this it's forcing against that valve and it's pulling that valve closed so basically as soon as this gets to this bit and falls off that allows the valve to open but as soon as this pushes back it lifts the valve back up so it lifts the valve like so. So if we're forcibly pushing this, and this is forced against the valve, that means it's driving it into the head, into the, the into the, the valve seat like this. And it, there's a pressure there to keep it closed. As soon as this thing expands, so as soon as this valve starts to grow, as soon as this starts to heat up, as soon as this cam starts to heat up, this cam is going to expand, pushing even harder against there. All this is going to do is apply more force to this rocker, but this rocker, more force to this rocker, but this clearance has been kept, this, uh, this is smaller because these have expanded. This has expanded. The collar that holds it, so this collar here that rides against the valve, that expands, everything expands, and you have a it's not a binding situation. Your valve pops off, right? You drop a valve, right? It just pops off that section of the valve. You see where that collar is? Let's zoom. See that collar is there, a recess here for the collets to go into. It just goes and just pops that head off. 
because there is far too much force. Um, you know how water can go in between rocks freeze and that can just pop rocks in half. Same kind of thing here, but it's not water. It's not hydraulic action. Well, it's actually, um, it's almost like hydraulic action, but it's not, is it? Because it's solids. Just like driving a wedge in between something. If you put this system together and just took a chisel and whacked it like that between the cam and this rocker, either the cam's going to fuck up, it's going to try and get out of its bearings, which I very much doubt. It might pop the cap off, it might snap this, or it'll just snap the tip off your valve. Because if this can roll and is allowed to move, if you just stick a wedge in there and whack it with a hammer, this is going to lift up like that, and it's going to pop the head off this valve. So, to stop that from happening, we need a clearance. You know, so for this rocker here, this forked rocker, so we've got this um, forked rocker like this. Yeah, lifting against this valve. Here's the valve here with its collet thing here, like so. Because it's, oh, you can't see shit. Just like that. All right, so we've got the fork here and then this collet thing. There has to be quite a bit of clearance. If we have a lot of clearance, then what's going to happen is, is the valve is going to drop. So, for instance, if we have the valve and then we have just, we'll keep this all as one part like that, let's just say the collet block, and then we have the fork come in and lift it like so. So, this is applying a force like this. If we have a gap, then we can be allowed for that thermal expansion. But this valve will drop that tiny bit, dink, onto that valve, which means. On this end, the valve is slightly open, which means it's not bloody closed, which means it fucks everything up. Compression, everything. Well, just everything just fucks everything up. So we need to meet. These have to touch. So in the closed position, this fork has to sit against the collet, and that's what the spring's for. This spring here that sits in here, like so, applies a slight load, a preload, to this finger this rocker just to lift it up so there's a constant force basically just so it presses against the valve seat if you don't have that you're gonna fuck everything up like literally you're just gonna fuck everything up so there has to be some kind of basically it's like a conformal bushing there has to be some kind of give in this system otherwise it's going to pop um, and it will literally just pop itself to pieces um, because, and I imagine you get up to a hundred degrees, maybe even less than that, and the thing will just pop. I wonder if there's any way we can do that. There is a way I can do that. The way you do that is change this bottom shim so she's too way too tight and get rid of the spring. And you just run the engine, it gets to temperature, and then you'll just do it. Go pum 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 as it popping valves off. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but yes, it's not a springless system, it's where the spring is. Now some people might ask, is this spring, um, you know, is this torsional spring, is this uh, susceptible to the same issues that compression springs were? Yes, you know, it ha it'll have a resonance of how much it can flex backwards and forwards. It just depends where the resonance range is of this spring. The range could be a lot different. As in, it only starts to resonate at 35,000 RPM. It's all right, we don't go that high. Um, kind of thing, you know what I mean? So, at the end of the day, a valve spring, uh, a compression valve spring, has to have certain, it has to apply a certain force because not only do you want it to work at resonances, but you actually want it to shut the valve and shut the valve on time, you know what I mean? Um, so you want a, you know quite a stiff spring with a lot of force so it can basically shut that valve it's not so much keeping the valve closed it's just literally to have that acceleration um, because of the force applied you see all these equations and stuff they work backwards as well if a compression spring applies more force so let's just say uh, the force of the spring oh god stay fuck this up the force of the spring um, 
if this is great, you know, if this is high, right high, let's just say the force, of the spring force, or the force of the spring is its mass times acceleration. Well, that works fine, you see, because if we increase, the mass is always the same. So this is a constant, you know, the um, valve that we're trying to move remains the same. If we have a higher force, that means that the acceleration is going to be higher. You know what I mean? Because we're accelerating the same mass. So if we, if this was 10, you know, if the force was 10, and we've gone up to, you can't fucking see. The force was 10, but we've gone up to 25. Well, where do you get this in, you know, in Newtons or whatever? It doesn't really matter. Um, if you look at this, it's like, right, so you've gone up to 25. Well, the mass has remained the same. So it's obviously, you know, the acceleration that we can increase. So acceleration is also important. You do um, design around this, so your acceleration of your valve at certain RPMs, and we'll go into this because this is this is we're getting to jerk and stuff. Um, but uh, cam profiles are there's a lot lot more to cam profiles than I think that people think there is, um, because we were talking about stuff like uh, valve bounce. Um, and you know that uh, is all to do with cam profiles and so is valve flow really it's all involved it's all intrinsically involved with each other any road yeah so i'm going off on a bit of a tangent there but um the whole idea of the decimal system wasn't to make it springless it was a problem that springs had and um this was one of the solutions to that, you know, to that issue. Now, um, one last thing, which is, so why if this problem's pretty much gone, and obviously nowadays they have pneumatic valve springs in MotoGP, so why does that matter? Well, number one is, is that no one really makes any money out of MotoGP. It's all about making a presence and being competitive, and it's advertising, but meh, you know what I mean? The sale, if all of a sudden Mark Marquez wins on a Honda, the sales of Hondas don't double that from the previous year that he didn't win, kind of thing. Um, it is R&D, is most people will go into that, blah, blah, blah. But, um, you know, why is a Ducati still using this system even though it really doesn't have any benefits anymore? It doesn't have any benefits in MotoGP because they've got pneumatic valves, as in this was designed to replace valves because of the problems valves had um and on the road you know basically their sales are road sales so why are they going with this it's the fact that as they put so much r d into this design they put so much r d and money and stuff they have to make the sales back um it's almost like mazda that crack on with the uh wankel engine they invested so much more than everybody else did back in the late 60s, early 70s, that they just have to go with it now. Every Year on year on year, they just have to go with it to try and recoup over time, um, through sales, the money that it costs them to you know, develop these systems. And if it's there and people still like it, sell it. You know what I mean? If people want it, even though they're niche things, you know the Desmo system is a niche thing. Uh, why don't any, why doesn't anyone else really use it? Well, because the cat you've got it patented up to the bollocks. <laughs> a lot of them have a lot of them expired, but they keep on putting new uh, patents in to um, you know try and lock down their design and protect their intellectual property. Hope that makes sense. I'm sure, there's going to be some questions, and I'll see you in a bit.